Of course, we can't start without the professor taking his seat. What a wonderful problem to have tonight. We're overflowing, not enough chairs. Thank you very much, everybody, for being here. Ladies and gentlemen, a very good evening to you all. Kalispera sas. My name is Olivia Niku, and on behalf of the Greek community of Victoria, I welcome every one of you to this special event, the launching of the book of Professor Nikos Papasteriadis, Cosmopolitanism and Culture. A particular welcome to his wife, Victoria, his gorgeous daughter, Maya, who um, is going to help me a little bit later. There are a number of other special uh, welcomes I want to make. Uh, Mr. Gorgas, who is in charge of educational section of the Greek uh, consulate. I notice a number of uh, members of Neos Cosmos to every one of you. Thank you for, for your support and for being here on this occasion. To uh, Nick Andrianakos, who is a benefactor, benefactor of Alphington Grammar, also a very warm welcome. Mike Zafiropoulos, who pops up everywhere and supports so many of our causes. Thank you, Mike. He is, of course, a very busy man with uh, Frondida and sharing that and taking that through some um, very choppy waters at the moment. So thank you for being here, Mike. And um, John Militidis, principal also, who supports us. There are many others. I hope I haven't forgotten anyone because uh, we really welcome you all to this very special event. Last week... Nikos asked me to be MC to this occasion. That is uh, what is known in legal circles as voluntarily assuming a known risk. <laughs> now, because at about this point, it is customary for the MC to draw attention and pay tribute to the very long list of very industrious work and the immense achievements of the man of the moment, Professor Papasteriadis. Uh, they are indeed very considerable and extremely impressive. But I figure that you already know that because his reputation as an eminent academic has already preceded him. So uh, I wouldn't be advancing the night by traversing that ground again. Um, he is... Uh, a man who has produced an immense amount of exquisite work. So either you already know him by reputation or by a very quick click of a Google button, you will unveil an absolute plethora of exquisitely intriguing titles of productions and uh, publications he has made throughout his life, his very long list of academic achievements and uh, professional positions. So it is a, indeed an honour to be asked to MC anything that he does. I, however, not being very conventional, have decided to leave that to the side and attempt to peel back a little bit of the, oh, I see a very nervous... <laughs> oh, beautiful, game on. Um, I want to peel back a few of the layers of the public persona that you all know and try and discover a little of the real man. Are you nervous yet? I hope you are. I was nervous last week. <laughs> <laughs> nervous tension is very good for the creative juices, you know that. We'll get your next book even quicker. So to help me tonight, I'm going to ask the delightful Maya, his daughter, to come up and help me in this task. Please make Maya very welcome. Thank you, darling, for help, uh, helping me. You can bend down a bit if the microphone's not enough. All right. Now, you know your daddy better than most of us in this room. <laughs> And we're trying to find out a little bit about him. <laughs> so can you tell us, please, what makes him really, really happy? Um, nice and loud, because they can't hear at the back. Um, uh, I 
What you talk? When you kiss him. Ah, oh, not only a writer but a lover as well. And I hug him. And you hug him, yes. And I hold his hand. And you hold his hand. Who would have thought what a gentle side to this uh, colossus of an academic. <laughs> now, what makes your daddy really, really cross and grumpy? Um, when I don't kiss him, when I don't hug him. <laughs> when you don't kiss him and you don't hug him. Oh. And I don't hug his hand. And you don't hold his hand. Anything else? Really That's all right. That's enough. And I didn't have a present for his birthday. And you don't have a, He gets grumpy when you don't have a present for his birthday. Well, <laughs> things you won't find on Google. <laughs> now, if Daddy was an animal, what sort of animal would he be and why? A lion. He'd be a lion. Now, why would he be a lion? Because lions um, sometimes happy and sometimes grumpy and very clever. Very clever. Well, Nico, you're not a pussycat. You are a lion and you're a lion amongst men. You heard it from your daughter. Now, if Daddy was king of the world, what do you think he'd really like to do? Um, help others, speak every language. Or you think bubbles? Have for think speak, bubbles. For yes. speaking? For speaking. Uh, and help each other. And help each other. Well, could you find that on Google? No way. But Maya, you have been such an immense help. Thank you very much. You're a complete sweetheart. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> well done, Maya. Now, the next insight into Professor Nikos Papasteriadis' character is to look at who he chooses to have as his friends and associates. Vixime tus filosu na se Show me your friends and I'll tell you who you are. The people that Nikos has chosen to address us today um, at this book launch are in a stratosphere completely of their own in terms of creative talent and achievement. Firstly, we will hear from Max Delaney. Max is director at Monash Museum of Art, a position he has held since 2004. His previous positions included, amongst many others, director of Gertrude Contemporary Art Spaces, curator at Heidi Museum of Modern Art, secretary of Contemporary Art Organisations Australia, Board Member Public Galleries Association Victoria, Asia Link Strategic Ties for the Arts and Arts Victoria and Australia Council Advisory Panels. They are just some of the things he has achieved. He also holds and held a number of advisory positions. They include Art in Australia and Freeze. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Max Delaney. Um, good evening, everyone. Thank you very much, Olivia. Um, it's a very hard act to follow, Maya. <laughs> um, notwithstanding the great honour to participate in the launch of Nikos' new book, Cosmopolitanism and Culture, and to count Nikos as a friend and someone whose work I've always found incredibly exciting and game-changing and def quite defining of our times, I must confess to being somewhat daunted by this evening's role. Nikos is an inspiring, insightful and charismatic philosopher, cultural theorist and historian, and an equally eloquent lecturer, poet and storyteller, which are all eminent and magnificent vocations and qualities, but sadly they're not qualities I necessarily share to the same extent as Nikos, so please bear with me. Um, for the purposes of this evening's um, responsibilities, I therefore see myself in some way of an outsider, um, not being a cultural theorist, and I say that by way of a disclaimer, um, and am somewhat daunted by the prospect of doing justice to a book which is as nuanced and sophisticated as elaborate and encyclopedic in its cultural, theoretical and historical scope, 
not to mention its agency and promise. So I apologise in advance if what becomes a schoolboy gloss, but I can at least find some consolation in the knowledge that Nikos's book dignifies marginal figures and outsiders and returns those who might otherwise be characterised as lost or abandoned to the position of a speaking subject. Cosmopolitanism and culture is many things. It's a majestic form of history painting, as reasoned and romantic, as grand and persuasive as Delacroix's liberty leading the people. Its narrative begins in 2001 with two era-defining events at opposite, opposite ends of the world. Um, the arrival in the Australian waters of the Tampa, carrying 433 refugees, and the terrorist attacks on the Pentagon and the World Trade Centre of 9-11. In his analysis of these events, Nikos charts the attendant rise and priority of national security concerns over those of human rights, exemplified in Australia by the Pacific Solution and the demonising of refugees. He elaborates the ways in which a politics of fear was mobilised to transform the landscape, the idea of barbarians at the gates, and in the context of the so-called war on terror, he describes the suspicion and fearfulness of invisible, faceless enemies within our midst, and then the ensuing redrawing of boundaries and resistance to the foreigner that these fears engender. Nikos develops the idea of ambient fear as a kind of dread, the sources of which are both unlocatable and ubiquitous, a fear which lurks, and I quote, lurks in the heart, exists in rumour and spreads from below. In a characteristically restrained observation, Nikos also noted that, and I quote again, being alert to stranger danger was elevated to a crucial form of civic duty. But he also identified the equally significant coming together of people from diverse political orientations to mobilise against dehumanising government policies and the subsequent appeal for a renewal of humanitarian principles, ethical behaviour and responsible citizenship. And in the sphere of the arts, he identified new artistic formations beyond nationalist models, which are characterised by transversal dynamics of flow, encounter and exchange, by ideas like intersubjectivity and the desire to understand one another, and by collaborative processes and actions to create new social realities. With the increasing interplay between event and image in what Nikos refers to as the ambient wars, the role of the artist and the symbolic um, producer becomes very pronounced. This is especially the case given the increasing aestheticisation of politics and also the politics of aesthetics and was exemplified by the increasingly profound struggle for a mastery in the realm of the image, as images of the collapsing of Twin Towers or Abu Ghraib or the video tactics of Al-Qaeda would attest. Nikos defines cosmopolitanism as referring to the social transformation that arises from the mixture of different cultures. In elaborating his idea of aesthetic cosmopolitanism, he identifies the demise of nationalism, reflexive hospitality, cultural translation, discursivity, and the forging of a global public sphere as key tendencies and themes through the book. Nikos also returns us to a consideration of his Greek ancestors, to Homeric journeys, and the duty of hospitality, which he identifies as a marker of justice. But he equally reminds us of the monstrous Cyclops, who would devour his guests, noting that every culture has the capacity to colonise the other, to make the guest submit to the authority of the host. The motive of the, of the journey reappears through the book in the role of migrants as pioneers, plotting journeys to dignify their lives, in the idea of mobility as a freedom to question the limits of existing structures, to engage with strangers, and to develop ideas formed in one culture in the place of another. And also in socially engaged and collaborative art practices, he identifies the moral and aesthetic function of art as emerging from the shared journey undertaken by participants. Um, in what is a brilliant treatise on the contemporary context of globalisation and modernity, 
cosmopolitanism and culture elaborates a breathtaking array of theoretical positions. In doing so, Nikos adopts the role of translator and mediator, which define his cosmopolitan approach. By renewing conversations and debates, establishing new dialogues, mediating and transcending disputes, so that what results is a kind of colloquium of, that he gathers of philosophers, scholars, artists and activists who are convened by the author and who generally welcomes the reader. Drawing further from the example of classical Greece, he sees analogies in the transitional in-between threshold space of the Stoa and the extra-disciplinary space of contemporary art, both being places where one can, and I quote, hover, browse, eavesdrop, rub shoulders and move on. I won't need to explain to our Greek host that the Stoa is a form of shelter or colonnade between the home and the parliament, and as such it could be considered a place between the public and private spheres, between the amateur and the professional, between the disciplinary realm and that of everyday life. For Nikos, the Stoa becomes a metaphor for the emergence of a critical consciousness within the transnational sphere. And he identifies in contemporary art the critical role of embracing ambiguity, in-betweenness, multi-directional flows and new ways to learn from one another. Nikos correctly argues that art practice is a process which is world-making rather than world-describing. Art practices produce as much as they reflect a worldview or a knowledge of the world. Art is a carrier of difference and a purveyor of paradox, he notes, and we are able to embrace these as positive terms. Nikos notes that creation is not just a product of its time, for it also comes out of a void and asserts itself as the new and necessary form of living. And as he argues, it is only through mobility and interaction, rather than stasis and segregation, that we discover novelty and creativity. In what I would argue is an excellent mission statement for art, Nikos draws from science and from complex systems theory to note that, and I quote, Matter is constantly involved in processes that include the drawing of semi-porous boundaries, interacting with proximate neighbours, developing responses that accelerate change or provide resistance, weaving into clustered networks and producing feedback effects that mutually transform matter itself and its environment. Like the coming together of new communities, Nikos describes the radical and mysterious ways in which creation emerges out of nowhere to produce newness and value, to renovate the social space in which we live. Cosmopolitanism arises not only from a moral imperative, but from an aesthetic interest in difference and in others, and in everyday acts of curiosity, attraction and play. He notes the ways in which artistic representations can supplement the realm of reasoned debate and scholarly investigation. So Nikos's book is significant for the ways in which it describes and defines new artistic formations, and in doing so it adds to the repertoire of art history, adding to existing formalist or biographical or social modes of art history. He, um, his cosmopolitan approach introduces new formulations and understandings where art becomes a medium for constituting the social. A project such as Francis Alice, The Bridge, where boats of fishermen are lined up between Florida and Cuba, provides, as Nikos suggests, a poignant image of the yearning for connection and the perils of the crossing. In the examples of media activism or do-it-yourself geopolitics of self-organised local activist groups, or in Rick Ritiravnesia's sculpting of hospitality, in Tino Segal's performances which insist on the experience of here and now. Nikos identifies relational artistic practices which encourage chance encounters, the sharing of a meal, the experience of the journey, a dance with strangers, as well as a politics of resistance where grassroots personal involvement at a micro level might nevertheless facilitate global change, as the recent Occupy movement might suggest. And in the examples of transversal artist activist groups, such as No One Is Illegal or Fadait, Nikos identifies the global orientation of contemporary art in new transnational alliances which are fragmentary, 
ephemeral and loose, often operating beyond or on the margins of institutions and in opposition to formal structures. These groups see borders as thresholds, as places to be crossed and transgressed, where mixtures are intensified and new social practices are enacted. With the shrinking of the public sphere and the loss of spaces for hospitality, Nikos elaborates the way in which visual arts practice might produce new and productive models of mobility and difference, initiating cross-cultural dialogue, setting up new relations between the local and the global, and establishing new spaces in which an ethics of hospitality might thrive. Nikos is mindful of the various critiques of cosmopolitanism. For instance, Boris Groy's proposition that postmodern taste for cultural diversity is complicit with the market operation. But his take on cosmopolitan is more reasoned and optimistic. Rather than cogs in a machine, migrants move in order to dignify their life conditions. He identifies both in the migrant and in recent forms of contemporary art practice, the emergence of new cooperative social networks. He identifies the cultural value of transnational and dias diasporic communities and their interaction and influence upon dominant host cultures. He sees cross-cultural communication as producing a recognition of human worth. With the rise of patriotism and the demise of multiculturalism on the political agenda, Cosmopolitan might also be considered a civilising influence. Nikos's book includes an extensive discussion of hybridity, which he sees as expanding aesthetic categories of creativity and context. He develops a positive language for representing mixtures that are formed in the contact zones of colonialism. In conclusion, Nikos notes that, and I quote, cosmopolitanism without multiculturalism is just an ivory tower, and multiculturalism without cosmopolitanism becomes a nasty ghetto. Each needs the other to come into being. Putting them together gives politics a whole new agenda. This simple truth, modest in its formulation, reveals the transformative genius and political imperative of Nikos's insight and thinking. To conclude, what better example can I offer of the value of cultural cosmopolitanism than the generous example of the author himself, a tall and handsome Greek Australian, <laughs> a Melbourne boy of convivial demeanour, a scholar of international renown, who is a poetic translator between and testament to the productive relations between the local and the global, someone who is enormously generous in deepening our historical understanding, sharpening our critical perspectives and broadening our cultural horizons. Thank you very much, Max. You can tell by that applause that no one is going to argue with what you just said, particularly in the last few minutes. <laughs> Next, we will hear from David Pledger. David is director of Not Yet It's Difficult. This is one of Australia's leading independent arts companies and David is recognised as, as a pioneer in the development of contemporary theatre. Together with a core creative team, Not Yet It's Difficult, has produced almost 40 diverse local, national and international projects, including original performance works, plays, public space projects and television and screen-based installations. Not Yet It's Difficult has a unique presence in Australia's contemporary arts culture Please make David very welcome. Uh, actually, when um, I was invited to make some remarks, I kind of took that literally. So, uh, Nikos, great, well done, thanks very much. <laughs> uh, actually, I, I would like to begin with a rhetorical question, which is how is such a precocious academic talent situated in such a nice person <laughs> as Nikos. It's an absolute pleasure and an honour that you've invited me to launch your new best self. 
Firstly, the surprises. As I, uh, as I leafed my way through uh, the new book, I was kind of surprised that there was nothing about sport. <laughs> we always talk about sport, Nikos and I, the rugby or Australian rules, anything that requires human motion finds its way into our conversation. And then I remembered he said, Look, whatever you do, make sure you read the chapter Mobile Methods. I thought, oh, okay, go to Mobile Methods. So I went to Mobile Methods expecting a comparative study between the lateral movements of soccer, football and rugby players. And all I found was art. And a lot of it. In fact, that's what this book is. More than anything, it's about art. Art, artists and politics. Which reminded me of other parts of our many conversations over the last 10 years and how they've really threaded their way through my own work. The systematic dismantling of the Australian character by John Howard, the demonisation of those who seek refuge from terror, and the way in which fear has been used by political parties to wedge electoral leverage to maintain power in a Faustian pact. Now, Dealing with such material, a tendency is to be strident, outraged, defensive and indignant, profoundly unproductive states. However, when Max was talking, I have to say, it really got my blood going again and I was zooming into the, all of those unproductive states that I think inspire an artist to defend space to defend the mental and the creative, the artistic, the cultural space that is ours and not theirs. So it's been a privilege actually for me as an artist to be challenged and contested by Nikos often with his intelligence, his respect and his good humour. This is his way. His interest in the long haul and the difficult terrain is really fundamental to his approach of putting artists and artwork at the centre of our broader cultural conversations. And as an artist, one is drawn to such people. We need such people. Against the flow, Nikos has a way of enabling artists to speak for themselves about their artwork and from then he takes his lead. As he says in his book, artists shape and reflect the relationship between politics and society, confounding preconceptions, blurring boundaries, abrading ethical positions, challenging the dominant set of values. This is our job. We are irritants. We are farmers of the imagination, processes of possibility in many ways and are governed by diverse financial, social and political conditions. We come in as many shapes, sizes, colours and designs as are displayed on the AFL's footy strip. So what kind of artists did he be found in, in this book here? Well, for the most part, they work across disciplines and cultures, which of itself and in the context of globalisation, constitutes a political engagement, intercultural and interdisciplinary. And this is the area of my own practice as an artist. The politics of engaging in this way is the politics of the seen and the unseen, the visible and the invisible, of immersing oneself in the spaces in between cultural, social and artistic constructs. Now, the artists he selected do not represent any global constituency or movement, and this is good. There's no sniff of celebrity in this. Selections based upon his own artistic inquiry, which is mediated by an interdisciplinary methodology, which is really good. It's smart processing when you read it, really, because if you're writing about the mixed and the mobile, the multicultural, 
and the cosmopolitan, one needs alchemy as your analytical default setting. These are curious times for artists. These days, the best theatre is found in a place once upon a time and not so far away called Canberra. The best dance is on your television. The best art is on the street. The best music's in your ear. And cinema is dead. Well, according to Peter Greenway, who 10 years ago said as much at the Berlin Film Festival. Economically, well, artists are constantly told we are part of an industry. But what kind of an industry is it? Whereas its primary producers, most artists live on or below the poverty line. So in the age of globalisations, globalisation, artists are its canaries in the coal mine and we're struggling for breath, which is a worry. Because if the artist is struggling to survive in a society as well off as ours, then what does it say about its future state? Now, as this book is a book that speaks to the, to the role of fear in determining and shaping our behaviours, my fear is that we are entering a non-political phase where the disconnect between civil society and political culture is complete, where the crucial engagements that determine the conditions of our daily life delete political culture and by definition are absent of political process. If so, it's going to be a dangerous period. The system at the heart of our political processes is democracy. And history tells us that in the absence of democracy, ideology thrives. Fascism, communism, totalitarianism, all of these need the prism of democracy to moderate defilter and defang their toxicity. A conservative democracy is better than a fascist state. A socialist democracy is better than communism. Having a grandfather who fled jail in Mussolini's Italy and having spent time in the Soviet Union in its dying days, I feel these things to still be true. So, if we do enter a non-political phase, then is it the end of democracy? Or will some other system evolve? What kind of artists will be active? How will they explain this new paradigm to us? Will they be allowed to? What kind of artists will be in a book written in such an era? And, O oh great wizard, Papasti Guts, what kind of an artist will I be? Perhaps in your next offerings you will answer these now non-rhetorical questions. Thank you. David, thank you so much. I can hear echoing around the auditorium. Hear, hear. And very well said. Thank you. And now, ladies and gentlemen, the man we have come to honour, Mr Nikos Papasteriadis. You've heard a little bit about him as the night has unfolded. He has a humbling body of work to his credit over his years as an academic. Uh, many of you have already enjoyed his very entertaining and informative addresses to the Greek community. He is not some nerdy bookworm stuck away in an ivory tower, all isolated and lonely. He is grounded. He is real. He's very cheeky, and that's why I can lay it on him very thickly. He is a man we learn um, immensely from, and he is one of our most successful sons, and of whom we are justly proud. We have come to honour his uh, most recent work and I ask you to give him the welcome he has earned. Thank you.
speechless now. That's the way we like to do it. <laughs> this was truly the dream team, starting with my daughter and Olivia, um, the QCMC of the night, who, you know, there's no risk with this kind of legal team. <laughs> and these two muscular and elegant and worldly and cosmopolitan figures on my left, as always. Um, first of all, <clears throat> your modesty, Max, is completely unnecessary. Uh, I couldn't have summarised my own book with the clarity and perceptiveness and scope and vision that you used. You covered all the bases, all the parameters that I hoped other people would find, and it gives me enormous pleasure and enormous satisfaction to hear it coming back like that. And for David, as always, um, speaking of cheeky, he's the one that's cheeky. Cheeky and grounded also, and tall and handsome. And this. But if, if in a way, if I may say, Max covered the parameters, the scope, the, the territory, David, in his inimical way, goes straight to the heart and cuts into the core and sees the driving spirit behind what is there. So I did choose, well, didn't I, Olivia? <laughs> I know I had to pick friends. I've always I said to my dearest friend, Scott McGuire, who's here, I said, I know you have to suffer me, and you've suffered me for 40 years, but at least I'll bring you into the company of good people. <laughs> <laughs> now, um, so my first and deepest thanks to this wonderful team. I should also um, say something about the place and time. No, I mean the place and tie. <laughs> because nobody's ever seen me in a tie before. I've got a beautiful selection of ties, which I never wear. But my daughter insisted that I wear a tie today for one reason, that I had to look like Billy the government. <laughs> Her uncle Billy is the personification of the government. Of course, He's not wearing a tie tonight, but he usually does. And, and he and, his, and her aunt Betty, both of them being lawyers, um, are the personification of government, which is a good thing, I think, in my daughter's mind. But, so I'm now impersonating my younger brother, who's also the president of this wonderful institution. So that's the tie. Now the time, well, we're not saying, I can't say much about the time, but the place. I chose this place because it's Greek, yes. Now in, in the cosmopolitan heritage and all that. But I also chose this place because it's become my new university. I've been coming to these lectures every Thursday night and there's a similar attendance. And it's been an absolute inspiration and a homecoming in, in many, many ways for me. And I also chose this place because I actually love ruins. <laughs> <laughs> and. Most people know that this place is about to be pulled down. And I am a real advocate for that, because I, I described it to someone as a toilet with a lift. <laughs> Little did I know it would appear in Eros Cosmos a week later. <laughs> but, um, but I do love ruins, and it will be replaced by a new tower. And I'm already feeling sad about the fact that I need to get this place replaced. But I'll also miss it till the sun sets. And so I do thank my brother for organising this event, and I do also thank Costa, who does the actual organisation. <laughs> and I do hope that um, some people noticed what I said. <laughs> and um, Costa, I hope in this new tower there is a smoking lounge dedicated to you. <laughs> but on a serious note, um, both the speakers talked about what underpins creativity. And in physics is the term dark matter, which is the thing that makes, it, that actually is invisible, but is actually what makes the whole cosmos. And the dark matter is everybody in the creative world that supports the artist. And usually we think about institutions, governments, funding agencies. No. I'm talking about the major sponsors, which is your family. And so today I want to thank my father who's here and my mother and I'll then go on to thank my wife and daughter later. But I also want to say um, <clears throat> a little bit about the origins of this book. And as Max very accurately and astutely described, it did come from 
uh, the Tampa and the 9-11. And as David very precisely said, it did produce in me all those negative emotions. Um, about three weeks after 9-11, I was on a flight to... Um, I could embarrass my wife right now, but, but I won't. <laughs> because I, I, I'll never forget actually the 9-11, because I was watching um, the West Wing, like most of you probably, that night, and suddenly the news flash came on and, um, and the reports started streaming through. And I didn't know whether I was watching fiction or reality. It was the end of the night and, and um, I couldn't quite um, actually believe what I was seeing. So after a short period of time, I went upstairs where my wife was asleep and I said, darling, I think the World Trade Center has just been blown down. She goes, yes, yes, darling, go to sleep. And I thought she must be right. So I thought I must have been imagining. And, um, and I went to sleep. When I woke up in the morning, I heard her screaming as she had turned on the TV and seen what had happened. And then I realized that I wasn't dreaming. A few weeks later, I was um, scheduled to speak in a, at a, a big art event in Helsinki. Um, and, and everyone said, don't go on an airplane. I don't know. I'm not going to miss out an opportunity to go to Finland. <laughs> but actually, when I got there, I thought to my father, why didn't he go north rather than south? Well, I quite enjoyed it. I thought it was very sophisticated, very nice. Right, quite the right scale for a city, actually. And um, it was on that flight that I started thinking about this idea of ambient fear. And I gave my first outraged lecture on this very topic. And um, I was making it up as I was going because I on, on the flight there was The Guardian, The um, uh, Financial Times. And I found actually The Financial Times the most informative resource at that time. And that outrage stayed with me, but I constantly felt that it was enough. Because sure, as Max has, has described it, I was witness to the way in which fear was being manipulated in our society. And I was angry at the way in which that fear was being used to subdue criticism and, and to justify the subtraction of liberties. And I also then noticed something new, because that, of course, fear is, that kind of fear is um, ancient part of warfare. You know, you, if you want to justify your attack on the enemy, you first produce them into a terras, a monster, a thirio, you know, and you caricature them in that kind of way. And, um, but in this case, what we were witnessing is not just this um, production of the enemy other but also this dispersal of the enemy as someone who's just like us and therefore indispensable and that they could be anywhere and everywhere. And suddenly source, the sources of fear were not over there on the other side of the boundary, but right here amongst us, amidst us, between us. It could be that knapsack that's on, that someone left on the bus. It could be that perfectly normal looking young woman who's just walked into the bar and young men have tried to chat up to her. It could be a whole bunch of other innocent kind of looking symbols that turn into very pernicious and explosive kind of things. And so I realised that fear wasn't object oriented as we normally think about fear, but it became more abstract, more dispersed, became part of our atmosphere. It was an ambient fear. And this ambient fear, I thought, was perhaps even more crippling and more um, oppressive because it has no way of being put down and distinguished and extinguished. And I thought to myself, how do we get out of this angry, indignant, chaotic, all-pervasive sense of hopelessness? And of course, you know, in Helsinki, the answer was already there in front of me. There was already artists who had made work about this very topic, even though the event had not even happened yet. There was already art that was shown to me how ca fear cascades into anxiety. And so I took that lead from that point on, as I have been for a long time, as David and Max have already described, and thought this might be and could be the way out of this mess that we're in. And in the works of all the artists that have already been described, I found those, that core issue, that, that fundamental concept of phylloxenia, of 
hospitality, of openness and exchange and dialogue, and the willingness to translate yourself in the presence of a stranger. The willingness to participate with other people in the making of something that you don't even know you're making. And this event became more crystal clear to me in a series of um, projects with um, an artist collective which included architects, activists, lawyers, whatever, all sorts of people um, from Italy and France called Stalker. And they'd come to do a project called Via Ignazia, which is the ancient road that links um, Rome with Constantinople and goes via Greece and went through Thessaloniki. And I watched this collective and how they operated in various situations, including in a, a wonderful um, encounter in a Sephardic um, Jewish um, retired old person's home in Thessaloniki. And um, in there, there was this woman called Victoria Venizelo. And um, when she saw the collective and how they were operating, she came up to Lorenzo, who didn't speak Greek, who was the director. And I was sort of acting a little bit translator for him. And she says to him, Lorenzo, I'm really, really happy you're here. And I really feel at home with your people. And he, I explained, blah, blah, and he says, blah, blah, and he goes, and he goes, oh, that's very kind of you. He goes, I like you because it's his psachnis there. Now, that's a word that I cannot translate into English. Psachnis there. I mean, it means that it's a quest, it's a journey, you're looking for something, but it's also an internal investigation into your being and essence of who you are. And she saw this instantly in these artists, this capacity to be in conversation with, with someone that reveals who you are, but also produces something new in the encounter with that other person. And then the, these group came to Athens and we did a, an amazing project in Lavrio, whereby Lavrio is a detention centre, but it's a detention centre unlike the Australian ones, which has got lousy services and things that don't work and it's smelly and the toilet's hopeless and all that, but there's no gates. You can come and go. And on the, on the other side of this detention centre of Lavrio is this little island called Makronisos. Now, everybody who's Greek in this room will shudder just at the mention of the word Makronisos, because that's the island. No, it's not the island that Paris and Eleni had a little holiday on their way to Troy. It's the island where the fascists tortured and detained communists. And the co-curator of this event, her father was um, one of the victims on this island. Marina Fokidis, who's Maya's godmother. And, um, and she organised a picnic on Macronisos with the refugees. It's the most crazy idea. Because she had to get the permission of the PKK to get this done. And she did it. And we went on two boat rides. And it was hilarious, because at one point there wasn't enough room for, on all the boats for all of us. We had to decide who stays on the boat, the artists or the refugees. <laughs> Yes, guess what? The refugees got off first. <laughs> and I stayed with the refugees, actually. <laughs> and, uh, and, um, and we had this amazing experience on this island. And I described this event in the Mobile Methods chapter, David. And, um, and little did I know that when I sent a copy of the book to one of my favourite Greek Australian poets, Antigone Kefala, who was born in Romania, she wrote back to me and said, she had stayed in Lavrio in the early 50s. And the way I described it in 2007 was exactly the same as it was over 50 years ago. That was the most chilling review I could ever expect to give, that things had, had, had stayed so much the same. Anyway, so it's that experience of hospitality that um, drove this book. First, it was the indignation that David quite rightly um, picked up on, but it was, as Max concluded, that desire to find hope in hospitality. 
And it's this kind of hospitality that I hope I can um, extend to my colleagues and friends, people like Scott and Amelia, who have come from, and, and, and Justin, and um, who have come from my department, and, and all the people from the Greek community who are my new fellow students of Greek culture. But there's also another person here in the room called Don Miller, who was one of my first and most important um, professors. In 1983, he um, took over a subject called Stratification, Power and Leadership. Not exactly the most sexy title for a course, but it was, because um, in those days, to get a course change, you had to go to the Prime Minister's or the Senate committee or something. So he, in order to do a new course on politics and art, he adopted the shell of an old course. And it was in that course that I was um, exposed to the working, the work of an, an author called John Berger. And um, John Berger has this amazing capacity to write about things in a way that makes your secret feelings feel normal, makes your hopes feel possible, makes your anger feel righteous. And um, it was my great honour and privilege, really, at, towards the end of my PhD, to have the opportunity to meet him, and then we became very, very close friends. And for the last seven years that I lived in Europe, I spent every summer and every Christmas at his house in the, in the little village in the Swiss Alps. So the book is dedicated to John. John Don Miller also did another amazing thing for me. He introduced me to another man called Ashish Nandi. Ashish Nandi wrote who I also met in Delhi and here in Melbourne many times, um, an extraordinary book, a very short book, called The Intimate Enemy. And that book was about how, if, what is the consequences of hiding who you are? And this is very poignant for all the people of a migrant background, because people like George Papadopoulos has confessed to this. That he's described how his generation, my generation, to a certain extent, hid our identity from the world. And in that process, how we internalise the enemy. And, um, and how we, in fact, become the very thing that we're trying to often fight against. Or how we, through that fighting, we sometimes also produce the resistance of our own transformation, the seeds of our own transformation. But the other marvellous thing about this very slim little book called The Intimate Enemy is it has this most wonderful acknowledgement. And at the end it says... This book would have been a lot thicker and would have come out a lot faster if it wasn't for my wife and daughter. <laughs> That's true for that one as well. <laughs> but he then says, that's not the last line, he then says, but it wouldn't have been any, anywhere near as good. And then he pays tribute to them. And this is where I would like to pay tribute to my wife, who... Um, he threatened to divorce me if I didn't finally finish this book. <laughs> and she would probably threaten to divorce me if I don't hurry up and finish this speech. <laughs> but the book is older than Maya. And it's... <laughs> yes, it is, darling. It's older than you. <laughs> That's how much your mother has had to suffer. <laughs> but in the course of that time... Um, what I have learned with Maya and through Maya and with Victoria and through Victoria, both the value of family and the value of values. Now, I want to say this to all the bloody politicians in this country because um, they think deterring, sending messages to refugees is fine. You know, they think it's perfectly good to detain a refugee and their family, sometimes for up to seven years, three or five years, in order to send a message to someone else on the other side of the world. And they detain these people in the full knowledge that 90 or 5 percent or more will be found to be innocent and be worthy of, of asylum for status. But they will not hesitate, it seems, or have not reversed from this ridiculous policy, even though they know that this person who is worthy of our hospitality is being damaged 
in order for them to send this message. Now, anyone who has a family would rile with anger, their blood would boil if their child or wife for one minute of the day was treated with the barbarity that we treat refugees in this country. And so I'd like to end by saying what is happening to our politics if it's considered okay to mess with other people's families, to interrupt their lives, to destroy their hope in order to send a message to, in a bottle to someone else. What sort of challenge is that? And how can we stop that? I should end on a more cheerful note. But <laughs> I'm, st I'm stuck now. But Olivia, that's your job. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, in hearing Nikos and his two chosen speakers, what you have really been witnessing is how deep and how wide the gene of excellence is distributed in our community. Now, with all this pessimism, that has to be a cause for rejoicing and a reason to be optimistic. Thank you very much to um, all three of you. Thank you. I say congratulations, Kisanotera. We are very happy to have you there. And now I will um, ask for some questions if there are any. I invite questions, I don't insist on them. I think we've covered. Yes, thank you. And to whom do you address the question? I don't have the question. Oh, I'm sorry. They jump the queue. We are from when we know that our government groups over there, and we had at least five million people dispersed from their country, run away for their life. How they justify? They jump the queue. That's what I want to say. That's good. Well, that's it. If there are questions, I call for them again. If not, uh, I want to thank the Greek community for hosting this event and pay particular uh, tribute to Kostas Marcos, who is so busy doing everything he can't even return calls, but he is what he is. Uh, he is the Mr. Fixit of the Greek community. We are indebted to him as well. I now ask you to toast the continuing good health and creativity of Nikos in particular and his friends by remaining behind and joining us in a drink, if there are any left, I think there are, and thank you to every one of you for marking this special occasion with your attendance. Thank you.